My name is Abraham Goodman. I'm an opinion writer at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I'll be the moderator of our COVID law and policy briefing about medical rationing. This one will focus on issues and in the intersection with um, disability rights and protections for people with disability. I am super excited for our uh, three panelists, and, and I'll be as brief as possible to let them all have time to, to hash these issues out for you. Uh, first, we have uh, Leslie Francis, a distinguished professor of law and philosophy at the University of Utah, where she directs the Center of Law and Biomedical Sciences. She's currently a member of the board of the Utah Disability Law Center. She writes widely on issues in bioethics, disability, and law, including privacy, surveillance, and access to health care. Also with us is um, Sam Bagintos, who is a Frank G. Millard Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School. And during the Obama administration, he served as Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Narol for Civil Rights. And finally, we have Govin Prasad, who is the Assistant Professor at the University of Denver Sturm School uh, College of Law, who is specializing in health law and professional ethics, and is currently a Winnell Foundation faculty scholar in bioethics. And he recently co-authored a New England Journal medical article on the fair allocation of scarce medical resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. Starting with that, Govin, could you lay out the argument that you put forward in that New England Journal of Medicine article about how to prioritize care in this time? If we can start with you, if you can lay out the argument you put forward in the New England Journal of Medicine article about how to prioritize care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Leslie, can you then, as kind of a baseline before we get into the specific argument, can you walk us through uh, how laws on the books that are meant to protect people um, with disabilities, how they can come into place in decisions on rationing and with rationing guide guidelines and plans? Certainly. I'm happy to summarize for everyone three important federal statutes the Affordable Care Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. I should emphasize that I'm just summarizing federal law. Some states may do more. So the Affordable Care Act, Section 1557, which applies to entities receiving federal funding or administered by the Department of Health and Human Services, prohibits discrimination in health care on the basis of race, sex, or national origin, age, or disability. The Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in public services. That would be, for example, a state-owned hospital or public accommodation. Public accommodation specifically for doctor's offices and hospitals. For public services, it is discrimination to exclude or deny the benefits of services or programs or activities to any individual who meets what are called essential eligibility requirements with or without reasonable modifications to those principles. Under Title III, this is the accommodations title, it is discrimination to subject on the basis of disability, denial of the opportunities to participate in or benefit from the good services or facilities of the public accommodation. It's also discrimination to afford a class of individuals on the basis of disability an opportunity to benefit from the public accommodation, which is not equal to that afforded others, or to screen out on the basis of eligibility to people with disabilities. Importantly, disability discrimination Discrimination includes the failure to make individualized accommodations, such as auxiliary aids and services, like it's a hearing vacation. And for public services, there must be reasonable modification for people to meet essential eligibility requirements and public accommodation. Are not required to fundamentally alter what they do, must also make reasonable modifications. So now I'm going to turn it over to Govind and to Sam to talk about what recommendations were in the New England Journal article and Sam to Disability Rights uh, Washington. Great. Thank you so much, Leslie, and my apologies for the technical difficulty. Um, I'm just going to walk through um, the five most relevant recommendations from an article that I and uh, many other um, folks from different countries, um, doctors as well as ethicists, published in 
in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so the first recommendation that we make in that piece um, is that the um, most relevant value in a pandemic um, when setting priorities is to maximize benefits that mean um, saving more lives and saving more years of life. And we base that recommendation on it being a consensus across a variety of different expert reports I developed for the current COVID-19 pandemic for other pandemics and for allocating more generally. And we think this support, this recommendation is consistent, importantly, with um, non-utilitarian views that emphasize the paramount value of life, as well as views that um, are more utilitarian and emphasize population outcome. Um, I think it's um, important here that uh, triage policies that save more lives will um, also end up saving the lives of more people with disabilities, because even though these policies might assign lower priority to those people whose disabilities do affect medical benefit, the uh, vast majority of disabilities do not affect benefit from, um, say, a ventilator. Um, and related to maximizing benefit, uh, we also say explicitly that um, during a pandemic, uh, we do not recommend um, approaches that incorporate quality of life or quality adjusted life years into benefit maximization. Um, and again, we um, adopt that view uh, because that's also a view that's adopted in some of the other guidelines for pandemics. Um, that were developed previously, for instance, one commissioned by the CDC um, for pandemic flu. Um, uh, because of the importance of maximizing benefits, we do say that it can sometimes be justifiable to remove a patient from a ventilator or from an ICU bed, to provide that to others in need, and that patients should be made aware of this at admission. So another recent piece um, in JAMA talks about uh, presenting ventilation or an ICU bed at the outset as a time-limited trial um, for success. Um, and again, um, we think that at least I think I say, I'm thinking to myself, that this sort of prioritization will be better for patients with disabilities as a group, including um, patients with disabilities who come to need ventilators um, later on in a pandemic. So having a uh, reallocation as opposed to first for serve will be better um, for, for capability. Um, the second recommendation we make, which is related to the maximizing benefits of more lives, is that um, critical interventions, um, uh, ventilators, therapeutic, uh, protective equipment, ICU beds, um, if we get a vaccine, those should go first to healthcare workers on the front line um, who um, face a high risk of infection. Um, and um, if those workers um, are unable to work, it'll lead to um, even worse scarcity and um, make it more difficult to save lives. Again, I think uh, saving more lives by safe healthcare workers who also save with disabilities um, in a first come first serve or lottery approach would make that more difficult. Um, we say more about why first come first serve is uh, we think an unjust approach, that it would uh, benefit patients who live closer to health facilities. I would be worse for people who happen to get sick later on. And it's notable in this context that in organ allocation, the recent report by the National Council of Dis on Disability um, rejects a first-come-served approach um, for um, uh, certain organ allocation policies and worries about some of the same um, issues of first-come-first-served about it favoring uh, people who have better access. Um, last couple of recommendations are that um, prioritization guidelines should respond to changing scientific evidence, so they should be based on evidence, and they should be based on evidence of specific intervention in question. Um, and then the last one is that um, um, patients that have COVID-19 should neither be favored nor disfavored with respect to other patients, other medical conditions. We say peer allocation should apply across everyone who needs resources. Um, so that's just a summary of the, um, I think, the five most relevant recommendations of this to the office. Thank you. Um, we, we're going to uh, continue and uh, a bit brief because we're, we're already past the half mark. But Sam, can you, for, for the non-lawyers among us, can you kind of uh, reconcile these two issues? One, taking into account things like most life saves, most years of life saves, other ones not taking into account disability that for some can be construed also kind of like as past medical history, right? So so how do we reconcile how we make sure that we do that in a way that does ensure that disability rights are protected? Yeah, so that's great. And I really, I really appreciate the chance to talk with these folks here. I mean, I, I think that the important thing from the perspective of disability discrimination law, you know, disability, all the laws that Leslie was talking about, I, what they all say one way or another is that a, a, a healthcare provider is not allowed to discriminate against a qualified individual with a disability because of the disability. We're especially concerned in a context like this, and let's just use the heuristic of that you have a ventilator and you have to decide which patient to allocate it to just because it's easy to understand. You know, we're especially concerned in a context like this if the hospital deciding which patient gets the ventilator is going to be making that decision based not on the ability of the ventilator to actually help the person get through coronavirus, um, but instead based on some pre-existing distinct disability or condition, right? And that's the, 
that is what um, the disability discrimination laws really focus on here. Um, and so, you know, there have been, there are a number of states that have adopted various kinds of protocols for life-saving treatment in the context of a pandemic or health emergency where, where there is scarcity. Um, a number of them adopt rules that specifically deprioritize people with pre-existing conditions that are disabilities, not because the treatment will be ineffective as to them, uh, but because of some projection about either the quality of their lives if they get if they if they get saved, um, or the number of years they will live if they get saved. And so I'll just like throw out just a couple of quick examples. I don't want to get bogged down in this, but you know I've been I've been one of the lawyers uh, challenging some of these policies in the last week or so. In Alabama, the policy we challenged said don't offer mechanical ventilator support for patients with such conditions as severe or profound mental retardation, which is the words they use, not not the terminology we would use today, uh, or with moderate to severe dementia or with severe traumatic brain injury. Um, other states say we want to look at uh, baseline functional status in deciding to whom to allocate life-saving treatment. And so give the ventilator to the person who has more energy, more ability, not because not because they'll, they're more likely to have their life saved, but because they'll live longer afterwards or more importantly, live what are thought to be higher quality lives afterwards. And, you know, from the disability perspective, we're especially concerned about a couple of things here. Um, one is this quality of life judgment. And it and it was nice to see in the in the piece that Govin co-wrote, um, the, the authors agreeing, at least in the context of this pandemic uh, and the emergency created by it, judgments about quality of life ought not to be a basis for deciding who gets who gets treatment. Although judgments about quality of life are actually deeply embedded in all of these policies that we're talking about that challenging right now. Um, and, and I think that's important because, you know, judgments about quality of life, first of all, you know, raise all sorts of difficult ethical issues. Secondly, if you ask people with all sorts of disabilities um, what their quality of life is, um, and then you ask people without those disabilities what the quality of living with a disability is, you get very different answers. And there's a real risk that the biases of non-disabled medical professionals, and there are very few disabled medical professionals, the biases of non-disabled medical professionals will be influenced decisions about quality of life. Now, in the paper that Gobin published or co-wrote, they say, well, quantity of expected life, number of expected life years following treatment is something that should be considered. And I think everyone would agree that, you know, if you have someone who's going to die in the near term, in the very near term, with or without treatment, that they shouldn't get the life-saving treatment if someone else, if someone else gets it, because the treatment will just be ineffective. But a lot of the policies that do rationing are based on considerations that go much longer than the, than the very near term. You know, I've seen policies, even relatively good ones in other respects, that look to five or 10-year predictions of survival. Um, and at that point, if you have a purely utilitarian calculus about maximized number of life years, you might say, favor the person who you predict to survive longer. But considerations about predictions of, of number of life years saved are also going to be influenced by biases about disability. It is a very common phenomenon for people with all sorts of disabilities to get prognoses from their doctors that, that you know, you're going to die in two years that turn out to be wrong. Um, and, and that's in part because of this persistent bias. So we, we really worry about quantity of life predictions as well as quality of life predictions here. So I think that kind of lays the issues on the table for you. Yeah, that, that was fascinating. Thank you. Differentiating kind of gen general and, and maybe healthcare needs with prognosis, which are very different things. And Leslie, when we talk about prognosis, when we think about that, should we think about COVID-19 prognosis or should we think kind of like, um, should we, or should we think about like general kind of prognosis uh, of the individual afterwards? How should we think about that in that context? So, so I take it that this may be a significant difference between the disability rights perspective, as Sam outlined it, and um, the piece in the New England Journal, that from a disability rights perspective, it should be an individualized assessment of the benefits of the treatment of COVID-19. 
where not taking into account, for example, whether somebody has a condition, such a life-limiting condition such as cancer that might kill them in a year or two. From the perspective of Govind, I think that second consideration, length of life saved, would make a difference. And so I would ask him to comment on that. Yeah, we're, we're at time, but I would also would love, Govind, to hear you uh, respond to that. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so I think that it's important to um, try to unpack what we mean by an individualized assessment. So I think um, some of the model guidelines that I think accord in a lot of ways with or recommendations in the New England Journal um, use um, assessments like um, organ failure scores, which are, I think, not perfect, but I think do aim at trying to look at the question of benefit um, from the ventilator. Leslie asked a very good question about what about people who, in some other work, I put it as uh, people who face an independent threat to um, living longer um, from disability, the threat coming not from the ventilator being less effective, but a cancer that might um, affect um, their, um, shorten their life in some other way. And I agree that it raises different questions. The challenge I have here for some of the disability rights work that I see is that I think it's important to note that these kinds of judgments are not based on um, stereotyping or sort of mistakes about disability. I think it's important, in line with what Sam said, to be base those not just on doctors' hunches, but on evidence. But it will save more years of life for people with disabilities in general to focus resources on um, saving more life years, again, because um, most disabilities aren't going to have the sort of short-term, um, five, ten-year effects that cancer does. So I think it's important to not just say triage will be worse for people with disabilities, but to acknowledge that um, different triage policies um, are going to have different impacts on patients with um, different types of uh, disabilities. And I think there's good reason to believe that ones that, say, focus on five years' survival will be better for patients' disabilities as a whole, even though they may be worse for patients with specific disabilities. We are at time. But Sam, could you, um, if anyone who is a uh, um, person with disability who is receiving care right now and is concerned about whether or not their rights are violated, is there any place group resource that you could recommend that they reach out to? Yeah, absolutely. So every state in the union has an organization federally funded to protect the rights of individuals with disability. It's called a protection and advocacy system. It's usually called disability rights and then the name of the state. Um, you can call those folks. There's a national organization, National Disability Rights Network, that is network of all these organizations. So reach out to either one of those and, and you can, you'll can you be able to talk to someone who can help you work this through. Thank you very much to Leslie uh, Francis, Sam Bagantos, and Govind Parsad for tuning in and for everybody who tuned in to our two panels on medical rationing. This has been fascinating and we will share links and resources to everything that was talked about. Uh, see you on the next COVID policy and law brief. Thank you so Thank much, Abe, and everyone else. Thank you. Where um, I think you can uh, leave the call. She, it's just, there's a lag, so Faith is just making sure that she uh, stops the live recording uh, on the right time. But I think we are